something uh, completely different. I also want to talk about the Romans. I'm going to talk about the Romans on the other end of the Danube frontier. Actually, the easternmost fort uh, on the river. So we've just gone from the Netherlands to the Danube Delta, Romania. And I am an archaeologist, but I also run a, um, a field project, a field school uh, at the fort, which is called Helmers. And when I read the um, the brief for the session, it occurred to me that I could contribute from the perspective of somebody who tries, has sort of accidentally stumbled upon bringing in different demographics to excavate and um, kind of crafting a field school that appeals to uh, non-standard field students, so people other than the undergraduates and the postgraduates who need field experience for their degrees. Um, so today I'm here as project coordinator for excavations at Hamnerse which, as I said, is an international field school that excavates the Roman fort um, in the Danube Delta, Romania. I'm going to present an ongoing case study of what I've termed participatory archaeological tourism, or the direct engagement uh, with the nation's cultural heritage by working on an archaeological excavation as an alternative tourist experience. Um, I've arrived at this topic more or less by accident over the past few years, um, as Halmeris began to attract retirement age volunteers, um, in addition to our typical undergraduates and postgraduates. And in the past three years, we've had over 100 volunteers, and about one in 10 were over the age of 50. Most, in fact, were in their late 60s and 70s. Um, they hailed from the US, uh, UK, France, Australia, and New Zealand, and they came to our site hoping to learn a new skill, get their hands dirty, uh, have an experience that would give them a sense of empowerment and agency, as they learned about the people, culture, and landscape of Romania. Um, I shall examine how welcoming this atypical <coughs> demographic to our field school has benefited the project and all the volunteers, and how I believe encouraging such alternative tourism is for the, the better of our discipline <coughs> and archaeology as a whole. Um, my overall thesis today is that by engaging this demographic of globe-trotting retirees, we can advocate for a critical awareness towards the presentation of the past uh, something which seems to be, now I realize I'm just uh, potentially criticizing some of the speakers who's already gone, and I wrote this for archaeologists, not heritage people, so forgive me, uh, which I think can be absent from the heritage consumption that's really driven towards making a profit. Uh, so briefly, Hamiris is a Roman legionary fortress located in the Danube Delta, which is a very rural region of Romania. It's occupied from the 1st century CE to the 11th. Uh, it has a wealth of material culture and perplexing architecture, which makes the site ideal for a field school. Uh, since 2012, myself and my colleagues in Romania and Greece have developed a program that attracts up to 40 volunteers a season. One of our primary goals is to offer an affordable field school experience that can nonetheless, nonetheless independently finance the excavation. The project has diversified as it has grown, and though I would never have suspected that spending four weeks in the heat, dirt, mosquitoes, and isolation of a Delta fisherman's community would appeal to anyone besides archaeologists, apparently it does, and uh, judging by the increasing number of retiree applications. Um, in addition to the excavations, we take volunteers on trips to sites in the Danube River and the Black Sea, uh, to museums in nearby, nearby cities, and on river cruises in the river cruises in the Delta. Um, they also have a three-day weekend during which most choose to visit Transylvania, uh, where they view sites like uh, Bran Castle of Dracula fame that are key in uh, the national heritage landscape of Romania, something I'm going to come back to in a few minutes. Um, so back to the excavation. Uh, what happens when you've got volunteers in their 60s and 70s working alongside a bunch of 20-somethings in a trench? Uh, well, firstly, the 20-somethings uh, work a heck of a lot harder when they see the work ethic of somebody who could be their grandparent. Uh, it bridges the generation gap, uh, promotes mutual understanding and respect, and gives the 20-somethings a uh, chance to learn how archaeology, which is generally their chosen career path, uh, can inspire the public. And it gives the older generation a chance to understand the challenges and life experiences of the younger, as they often are struggling to make the transition between higher education and building their own career. There are also challenges in having a diverse pool of volunteers. 
Uh, for instance, volunteers not trying to compete, uh, complete degrees in archaeology sometimes fail to see the need for hours spent pottery washing or cataloging artifacts. They're like, really, can I just go take a nap? I'm like, oh, we have to do this too. Um, they can overestimate their ability to keep up with the physical demands of the project and are often unwilling to admit when they need to slow down. Um, that being said, I found that most of our older volunteers work extremely hard and are able to focus intensely on the work at hand, which is something the 20-somethings can often lack. Uh, regarding the logistics of the excavation, uh, while most of the 20-somethings happily devote a significant amount of their downtime to social activities, uh, the retirees benefit from accommodations slightly removed from the main crowd so they can retreat to peace and quiet rather than party every night. Uh, the retirees also take the time to really connect with their Romanian hosts uh, through sign language if necessary, uh, building cross-cultural relationships which often endure, endure after the season has ended. Uh, this is something that I particularly believe archaeology is uniquely capable of offering. An excavation presents the chance to meet and bond with the people whose lives you impact by traveling to their home. And because this excavation is, such, is in such a remote foreign place, it's important to have um, important for the health of the excavation and the project itself to have a group of volunteers who can create a healthy community living and working together and having people with such varied life experiences helps to accomplish this. Um, so how does this participatory archaeological tourism benefit the discipline as a whole? Uh, firstly, it's not a new phenomenon at all. Uh, organizations like Earthwatch have been funding archaeological research <coughs> through volunteer participation <coughs> since the 1970s. However, this choice that people are making, that is, choosing to actively help uncover the past of a foreign country, is of particular importance now as heritage consumption becomes increasingly commodified. The consumption of the past, or heritage consumption, is defined as people living and interacting with places that have a historical aspect, or presented as an authentic representation of the past. Uh, Rowan and Barham write about how they struggle to understand how ancient periods and sites are selected and prioritized for promotion and consumption, and how the past was becoming more than a concept useful for provoking political action and reaction, but a resource that could be utilized for widening the profit margin for various endeavors. There are archaeological sites in every country which bring in significant revenue. And I'm not saying at all this is a bad thing. Money is good. We like money in archaeology. It's very hard to find it sometimes. Um, England has Stonehenge, Greece has the Parthenon, Italy the Colosseum, Israel has Masada, Peru is Machu Picchu, Jordan is Petra. All are marketed for their stunning level of preservation and the supposition that they accurately represent the past of the nation. Heritage display, like every aspect of archaeology in the past, is embedded within nationalism and globalization. Benedict Anderson wrote of the imagined community of a nation, created in part through a perceived connection to a common past which serves to unite the people. Heritage sites are the tangible representation of the imagined connection between history and the present. And if you have sufficient wealth, uh, you can travel around the world and visit any heritage site you wish. So the heritage sites that are chosen for promotion as a national attraction generate wealth and require wealth to visit, thereby making them accessible to only a select group of people. Archaeology itself as a discipline was born out of the rich man's hobby, uh, those antiquarian gentlemen who had the time and resources to devote to their interests in the classical past. And I find it interesting that for all the progress in making archaeology a socially conscious discipline, the product of our work still requires the same time and money to visit. So how should we understand and analyze heritage tourism? Uh, Portia et al. argues that while people generally assume heritage tourism is simply a subset of tourism based on the ancient features of an attraction, a more fitting methodology is to focus on the social aspects of their visit, on their motivation and perceptions of the place rather than on the place itself. So why are people coming, and why do they want to be there, and how do they see it, how do they understand it? I believe this is a key point, uh, focusing on the aforementioned motivations there is an important distinction between acting as a relatively passive consumer touring the heritage landscape of a place foreign to you and choosing to actively help uncover the past of that place. So if a person is motivated to come to rural Romania and dig in the dirt for four weeks, out of interest in the past, a sense of adventure, the desire to learn something new, or as a, one volunteer pointed out, having seen Indiana Jones in the cinema as a child, but then they are situating themselves as an active agent in the process of heritage, heritage consumption, creation, not consumption. 
So the question is, uh, do they, however, understand how archaeology impacts the present? Going back to Hamiris, um, Hamiris is uniquely suited to impart this lesson. The site is the focus of an annual pilgrimage of the Romanian Orthodox Church, which often takes place during our field season. In 2001, archaeologists discovered the remains of Astion and Epictet, two early Christians who were executed in 290 CE and later reburied in the crypt beneath the basilica built under Constantine in the early 4th century. They are the earliest homegrown saints for the Romanian Orthodox Church and proof of the longevity of the Christian faith in the area. When they were discovered, the church tried to declare the whole of Halmiris a holy site and forbid further archaeological investigation. They were unsuccessful as the Romanian Institute of Archaeology had the support of the government in opposing this designation. Instead, only the basilica is now officially holy. The church has nonetheless refused to pay for the preservation of the crypt and prevented alternative funding being sought. This is an area in which collaboration would be something we really need to work on. Uh, they have spent the last decade or so building an elaborate church and monastery a kilometer distant, which technically is still on the grounds of Hamiris' civilian settlement. Pilgrims come annually to the site and the monastery for the official pilgrimage, um, and in smaller numbers throughout the year. So the discovery of the saints clearly impacted the local community just as the presence of the church continues to impact work on the site. And every year, our volunteers, including the retirees, come to Hamiris and are forced to confront their supposition that archaeology deals only with the past and the fact that their own work could impact the present in any number of ways. And for some, it is quite difficult to come to terms with the idea that their discoveries could be used to further agendas that they don't personally agree with. Uh, which do, uh, leads me to my final point, um, which is the importance of perception when dealing with the past. It is easy to treat archaeological sites as commodities and consider whether the experience is worth the entry price. That or feel a sense of relief when there is no one there asking for money. I am not saying that we shouldn't support excavation and conservation through charging for the privilege of visiting, as this is obviously very important. However, I think we should consider the perception of someone who is there to consume a product, that is the site visit, versus someone who is there to work. I think the latter is practicing heritage engagement rather than consumption. So what is different about the tourist who visits the heritage landscape in Romania, that is the sites that are well conserved and actively promoted for tourism, and the tourist that works on an excavation like Helmiris. Here are some of the sites of the heritage landscape. Uh, we've got Bren Castle, uh, Pelish Castle, and Rasnam Citadel, complete with Hollywood lettering. It is easy for a visitor to assume that these sites are authentic representations of Romania's past. But like all sites in every country, however, they promote a narrative about the past that benefits a group of people currently holding political power over the territory. Transylvania, the region where the, all these sites are located, has a significant Hungarian influence. The territory was only granted to Romania after World War I. At the time, 30% of the population in Transylvania was Hungarian. This is not something that tourists necessarily pick up when visiting the heritage landscape, as sites like Bran, Pelage, and Rasnov promote a national narrative about the past that disenfranchises a whole demographic of people. They further the argument that Transylvania rightly belongs to Romania, and indeed has always been Romanian. The tourist who spends a day or two visiting these sites and moving on with their trip has no reason to question what they are seeing, well, other than the surprising lack of Dracula in Bran Castle. The perception of these sites is entirely based on how they are presented. But what about the tourist who chooses to excavate part of Romania, rather than, or in addition to, traveling through the heritage landscape? After working at an archaeological site like Helmiris, the tourist now has a critical awareness of the challenges faced in excavation. The fact that all excavation is destruction, the fact that choices are made in excavation and conservation, which then in part impact the narrative being told by the material remains, the fact that investigating any past is a social action shaped by the biases and agendas of the researchers. Almost done, I promise. These are each issues that we discuss throughout the season at Halmiris, and by the end of the four weeks, we have a group of volunteers who have a passion for archaeology and a willingness to question what they are being shown. Excavation instills a critical awareness towards the presentation of the past, and this is, I believe, the primary benefit of engaging diverse demographics in hands-on archaeology. These globe-trotting retirees will continue to travel the world and visit archaeological sites, except now they might question what it is they are being shown, or why so much money has gone into conserving one site rather than another, or why the story being told excludes a particular group of people. 
This is how we can promote a cross-cultural understanding that goes beyond the narratives chosen by those in power to include those disenfranchised by the status quo. The experiences we have traveling and the understanding we gain in the place are based on the choices we make, the things we choose to see in the limited time we have. By diversifying those who participate in archaeology, we are diversifying the choices they will make when consuming heritage, something which I hope will trickle down and create an enhanced global perspective of the need for sites with many voices present. Thank you.